Hello and happy spring from First United Methodist Church in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. It is still cold at night. It's often cold during the day. The wind has been sharp, but the daffodils are up. So it's got to be spring. And the first song that you will hear today being played by our bell choir is called Hymn of Promise. And it says, in the bulb there is a flower, in the seed an apple tree, in cocoons a hidden promise butterflies will soon be free. In the cold and snow of winter there's a spring that waits to be, unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. And the sermon is in part about the last verse. In our end is our beginning. In our time, infinity. In our doubt, there is believing. In our life, eternity. In our death, a resurrection. At the last, a victory. Unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. And if you want to hear the bell choir again, ringing out victory at the end of the video, is what they played this past week. God of grace and God of glory, on your people pour your power. Crown thine ancient church's story, bring her bud to glorious flower. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the living of this hour, for the living of this hour. Let's worship together.
The scripture for this week is so familiar that anybody who has ever spent a week in vacation Bible school has probably memorized at least a small portion of it. Anybody who's gone to Sunday school for maybe three or four times in their entire life has probably come upon this verse, this passage, but especially one verse within it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. Within this passage, there's great comfort. And behind this passage, there's great confidence. Confidence that isn't just about the hereafter, but is also about the here and now. Confidence that people's lives, whether it's here or hereafter, matter greatly to God. A message and a confidence that life here and life hereafter go together. It's all part of one long, by God's grace, eternal life. That's what John Newton wrote about. It's what we sing about every time we hear amazing grace. Yea, when this flesh and heart shall fail, and mortal life shall cease, I shall possess within the veil a life of joy and peace. You see, the Bible doesn't treat eternal life as something that's automatic. The Bible treats eternal life as something that God gives us, something that God wants to give us, something that he wants us to have so that we can share eternity in God's presence. It's not a simple matter of being human. There were, there were lots of places in the Hebrew scriptures that speak about death in the way that, exactly the same way, honestly, that a, a modern materialist might do. In Isaiah, Isaiah says, Sheol cannot thank you, death cannot praise you. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your faithfulness. There is a finality in that that is the same kind of finality that you will meet among people who say, well, dead is dead. That's all there is. Once you die, that's the end. Nothing curtains, lights out. And there may or there may not, in this way of thinking, be an afterlife. But, probably not. Even in Isaiah, as he looks at things, at this point, he, he refers to the pit not even the grave, which has a little bit of dignity to it, but the pit, a place where you would just toss 
say a dead horse and go away. Yet, even in one of the gloomiest books of the entire Bible, one that thinks a lot about death and dying, Ecclesiastes, there is a sign that the writer was kind of struggling a little bit with, with the gloomy, those who go down to the pit sort of view. Or even wrestling with the idea that there is some sort of shadowy afterlife, sheol, full of ghosts and spirits and a catch-all place that is undefined, but definitely a land of shades and of diminishment. In Ecclesiastes, he begins to come up with the notion and to really kind of struggle with it that if we understand ourselves as being made by God and if life itself as we know it here and now is a gift from God, one given to humanity when God formed Adam from the dust of the earth and <clears throat> breathed breath, breathed spirit, breathed life into this first human being. Well then, there must be more to the story because although it's still impersonal and and final, there is a hint that this life that God gives to all of us has to mean something to God because it is his gift. And there may be something to what it is to live, to have that within you. And that maybe, just maybe, dying is more than simply your time running out. And so in Ecclesiastes, it says, all must go to their eternal home, and the mourners will go about the streets, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the breath or the spirit. The words are the same in Hebrew. They're the same in Greek. And the breath, or the spirit, returns to God who gave it. If God gives us life, then doesn't life belong to God? And when we're through with our time here. Shouldn't it go back to God? Now, when I say God gives us life, I mean us not just in an abstract kind of a way. I don't mean just God gives people life. I mean, and, and I think this is biblical, that God makes and forms and brings into being one way or another, individual and unique persons as a beloved creation. Something, someone who is cherished and loved if for no other reason, then we are formed in God's image. And whether it's the unnamed writer of Ecclesiastes or whether it's John who wrote the gospel and wrote about 
not perishing, but having eternal life. Whether it was Miriam, who led the women of Israel by the Red Sea in a song of triumph because they had just escaped narrowly with their lives from pursuing Egyptian soldiers. When I say that God gives us life, I'm talking about God giving us individually by intention life whether it's miriam john ezekiel whether it's the rich young ruler who one day saw jesus passing by and ran up to him and knelt down in front of him and said good teacher what must i do to inherit eternal life whoever it is God loves us. And if God intervenes in human history, and if God intervenes in individual human lives, as happened for all of those people, if God gives life, if God protects life, and if God is the one whom we trust to know when life on earth should end, then it grows clear that whatever life is, it is a gift to be cared for. And one that God's own self will cherish and care for when for whatever reason, we can't do that any longer. And when it passes from us. You want to know what God wants for our lives? Well, he loves us so much that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him shouldn't perish, shouldn't go down to the pit, but have eternal life. You know, it's natural, part of nature, for everything to fall apart and decay. Entropy. It's God's gift through Jesus that when we do fall apart and when our lives as we know them do decay, we do not just simply fall into nothingness and that the very best parts of what we do here and now, the very best parts of who we are here and now in time and space, are appreciated and even treasured beyond time and space in eternity. And when this flesh and heart fail, there's more waiting for us. And so it is that another person named John probably not the one who wrote the gospel itself, but whose collected visions make up the book of Revelation, tells us that I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who from now on die in the Lord. Yes, says the spirit, they'll rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. That's not about things that we do to earn a place with God in eternity. We can't earn that because God's already given it to us as a gift. And it isn't saying that we find ourselves there automatically. If that were the case, 
Well, maybe in the afterlife, maybe in heaven with God. There would be a, a handful of heroes there. But I don't know who they could possibly be. I mean, you'd have to rule out Moses. Because in his youth, he murdered an Egyptian soldier whom he saw mistreating one of the Hebrew slaves. He knew he'd done something wrong because he buried the body in a shallow grave. And eventually, when he was discovered, ran off and became a fugitive in the desert. Oh, he thought he was protecting life when he did it, but it turned out he took life and then ruined his own until God stepped in and redeemed what had been done. So check Moses off the list for easy entry. Um, and David. Good old David, you'd have to rule him out too. He, of course, if you remember, saw one day from the rooftop of the palace, just slightly down the hill, the wife of one of his generals, who was out at the time fighting in one of his wars, and looked down and saw her swimming, bathing, and said, ah, I, um, uh, somebody go tell her I'd like her to visit. And shortly thereafter, she sent a message back to him saying, um, I'm pregnant. So David tried a couple different ways to cover things up. But then when that didn't work, he simply had her husband killed to hide what he had done. So rule him out too. And you'd also have to rule out Zacchaeus, the tax collector, who had defrauded a lot of people and um, an unnamed woman who was caught in the act of adultery whose situation Jesus himself was asked to judge. Yet, go back to the Bible. And of Moses, it was written in Deuteronomy never since his day. Has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face? You see, they were friends. Oh, and David? Of him it was said, again in the Bible, that he was a man after God's own heart. That was said before the Bathsheba incident, but nobody took it out. Oh, and Zacchaeus, the tax collector? Jesus went to his house and hung out with him. And, and by the way, Jesus also called one other tax collector, at least one other, a man named Matthew, to be one of his closest disciples. If he hung out with them on earth, Maybe in eternity, there's a place for them too. As for the woman caught in flagrante delictu, Jesus let her off the hook, sort of, but only by getting everybody else who was accusing her, everybody else present, to recognize that none of them, and by extension, none of the rest of us, have any right to condemn one another. Condemnation isn't Jesus' big goal. For God didn't send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. 
Jesus came both to open the way for us into eternal life and to help us live the life of heaven right here. To save us and to sanctify us. The goals that Jesus came, he achieved. And by his grace, he draws us and God together in a way that he alone could accomplish. And he draws this life and the future beyond future close together. He makes them one. Life now and life to be. And no, we don't know exactly what that life will be like. I'm bold enough to refer to it as heaven. And we use all sorts of comparisons based on the moments of grace and joy and peace and hope and glimpses of God that we get here to describe the eternity of peace and joy and knowing God in a far more direct way that are to come. We speak of heaven as if it were a party or a feast. And we also speak of it as a place of rest. We imagine it as a, a great concert where the whole universe makes music for God. Sometimes it's considered a, a place where everyone is lost simply in the contemplation of God, the way that you get lost sometimes in, in looking at a beautiful sunrise, or, or you lose track of everything when there's a little bit of absolutely wonderful music that, that just takes you beyond yourself. Only it goes on forever. Sometimes we think of, or we hear described, or we describe ourselves, heaven as the sudden insight that we long for here sometimes for why things are the way they are. A place where we get explanations for everything that we wonder about here and now. Everything we don't understand, everything that troubles us as well it should. Somehow is explained or makes sense. And along with that, every tear is wiped away. And where there's healing from the, the bumps and the bruises and the scrapes and sometimes far worse that find us in earthly life. We hear of heaven as a place where enemies are reconciled. A place where we are forgiven and where we forgive. A place where we know as we know now, but really, really know the depth and the extent to which God has forgiven us. A place where we feel and know the love of God. Even more than we can and do here. And when we can feel those things here, and when we do feel those things here, we get a glimpse 
of what is to come. And as our lives here become part of that life, that life becomes part of the here and now. And there's no reason that, by God's grace, all of that stuff couldn't be all at once and forever going on. But above all, that life is what it is, or will be what it will be, because it's the gift of God through Jesus, who gave his life in heaven to share ours on earth, and gave his life on earth that we could share his in heaven. He told his followers, I'm the gate. Whoever, whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. What can I say? God so loved the world. Amen.